thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that very uh, kind uh, introduction. And um, I'm, I'll, I'm grateful to, to Choi Mun for organizing um, this visit to Singapore, which has been really, really enjoyable. And I'm grateful to the Health Service Board here for, um, for, for funding it. It has been a, a wonderful trip. It's nice to meet you all and learn about how, um, how you're building your genetic eye, uh, inherited eye disease research uh, unit here. And I'm also grateful for the great hospitality I've had I think people must have looked at me when I arrived and decided I needed to have more protein <laughs> because I have been given such, uh, every day I've been um, given such wonderful, wonderful meals. But anyway, um, so we're going to talk about the challenge of developing effective therapies for inherited retinal disease. And although some of the studies I'm going to discuss um, are disappointing in outcomes, um, you have to be as old as me to look back and see what things were like when I started. In 1983, when I started, um, in, uh, I'd just come back from Toronto, my fellowship, and I did two years of research with Alan Bird on RP. And when I arrived back from Toronto, I met, I won't tell you who it was, that one of the brightest young consultants at Moorfields. I mean, it was when I was a resident, he was outstanding. And he said, oh, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I'm going to do research in RP with Alan Bird. And he said, you must be mad. And he said, there's, um, uh, there's nothing you can do for these patients. It's very depressing. And nothing will change in your professional lifetime. Now, I don't know what the central message of this story is, because he, you know, very bright people don't always, I mean, it's difficult to see into the future. But when you look at what has happened in my career, in, in 1983, all that we could do was just look at the, the retina, tell patients that maybe in the future uh, things would, would improve. But now, you know, it just uh, 30, 40 years on, it's, um, um, we, can, we know most of the genes, we can manipulate genes, we can make animal models, and we can have human treatment trials of gene therapy. It's an amazing advance. Um, so I've got a few um, financial disclosures just for, I mean, basically, I'm, I'm giving up all of these things now. But the main things that's related to this talk is that I, as um, Joy Moon said, I, I, I was involved in three trials sponsored by AGTC uh, at um, UCSF, which I've handed over to a colleague. Um, I chaired the DSMB for Sanofi gene therapy trials for, for, quite, for a long time until, and, and in fact, that now um, uh, those trials have stopped. The only thing that I, I'm still doing is I chair the um, DSMB for um, the NIHR-funded NIHR study of choroiderenia gene therapy trial in Oxford, and I hope to move out of that soon too. But anyway, so a really, uh, it's a great honour and pleasure to give the, the Wallace Fowles lecture for, of Siri, and. Um, uh, this is a, a picture that I picked off the web of Wallace Fowles. I knew Wallace Fowles uh, reasonably well. And in fact, his career, in a way, uh, I didn't. I mean, I'm, I, I didn't come to his giddy heights of achievement, but I, our careers followed a similar path. He was a resident at Moorfields Eye Hospital. And in 1958, he was appointed a consultant ophthalmologist at Addenbrooke's Hospital. That was my first job, too. And like me, he left Addenbrooke's, which was a great hospital, it's now Cambridge Medical School, there wasn't a medical school there then, um, uh, to become Professor of Ophthalmology at the Tennant Institute in Glasgow. And um, you, it, he, he had an outstanding success in Glasgow, particularly in the field of, of melanoma. But what his greatest achievement there was, he stimulated other people to do, um, to do research in the field of ophthalmology, other clinicians. And in 1985, he was the founding president of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. He, he was far-sighted and could see that that was very important. The ophthalmologists came out of the Royal College of Surgeons and, and ran their own show. And I know that he then became, after a time, became the, ninth, uh, the visiting professor of the National, uh, I, uh, National University of Singapore and had a major uh, role in, in getting Siri up and running. He was absolutely outstanding uh, uh, individual. And... Um, and uh, he, was a, he, was a, 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 um, he was a great inspiration for 
younger people um, in, you know, like me in ophthalmology at the time. So um, he inherited retinal dystrophies were, were not his favorite topic, but um, it, it's, um, he would have been very keen for, for any, anyone in ophthalmology to, to, to try and bring science uh, into, into ophthalmology. So inherited retinal dystrophies, as you all know, affect one in three to 4,000 uh, people. Um, they can be stationary or progressive. It's the progressive ones that really cause the burden of, of visual impairment. Um, you can get central or generalized retinal involvement. It can be, as you've learned this week, syndromic or non-syndromic. And it's very clinically and genetically heterogeneous. I've put more than 100 genes here. It's probably more than 200 genes now if you include the syndromic forms. And the visual loss is associated with cone cell death or function. And so this is the, the, the key area that we're trying to preserve is, is the foveum, the macula really, the foveal uh, uh, area. And um, it, it, you can function quite well, especially in a place like Singapore where it's bright, you've got plenty of lights at night. You can function with poor you can function well in society with poor rod function. So what we've got to do is find a way of preserving the central cones. So their challenges are different in different disorders. So in RP, um, you have night blindness, peripheral field loss, and the central receptor loss comes late. And for people working in the lab or working in science, you know, the, the key thing is, is we need to understand why do the um, cone cells die. Even in mutations that only affect rods, like rhodopsy mutations causing dominant RP, the cone cells ultimately die. Now, we need to try and understand why that is. And the aim of treatment is pretty straightforward in, in RP. You need to preserve the, the functioning cones in the central retina. Or in patients that have already lost those, we need to find a way of, of either replacing those cones or finding other strategies to stimulate the downstream pathways, bipolar cells, ganglion cells, that are still alive in advanced RP. The challenge is completely different in central receptor dystrophies because the central cones are, are affected early. And again, in research, we try and understand what's the mechanism of cell death, how can we uh, slow cell death, but a very important area for central receptors dystrophies, can we replace cones? Because unlike the animal models that we use, um, the, by the time the patient has presented like with a central receptor dystrophy, you've already lost a massive amount of, 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 of central cones. You don't need many cones functioning in the central retina and the fovea to have normal vision. But um, so... One of the problems with comparing animal models with humans is um, the, 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 the experiments in animal models in the past, it's changing now, have tended to be done very, very early in the animal's lifetime before there's much in the way of, 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 of receptor, or before there's much in the way of retinal cell death. And it's perhaps not surprising that human treatment trials of the same procedure don't work, don't work as well. Now, with the visual loss in RP, um, uh, the, the, well, the visual loss in general, um, there's re retinal dysfunction, which is some disorders, central stationary light blindness, for example. The dysfunction stays the same throughout life, and the cells don't die. And um, they're not a great, you know, the, the people are not putting a lot of effort into finding uh, treatments for those disorders. In, in the diseases where photoreceptors die, um, like RP, choroideremia, um, we, we, you know, there's a lot of effort to develop treatments. But the central question is, what are you trying to achieve with treatment? Are you trying to achieve improved function, or are you trying to um, uh, uh, slow deterioration? Now, one of the issues here, which is making life, like, makes life difficult, is the drug companies, you know, when, when you get to the stage where big drug companies are taking over phase three trials, what they want is a readout of improved function because that allows them to um, not do such a long trial and to get a readout of success. Whereas 
in choroideremia and RP, you might have good central retinal function in early disease. And um, what, you, what will be a very achievable aim or very uh, acceptable outcome will be slow degeneration. But um, it, it takes much longer and more expensive trials to see that. And that's a, a bit of an issue in the field. Um, and you can use modern imaging, OCT imaging. This is the same patient over time. Um, and you can see that they're gradually losing central, uh, uh, central photoreceptors. You can use autofluorescence imaging, which we mentioned. You get a ring of, of this is not, on autofluorescence imaging, you get a, a ring of, uh, of the borders of which are on this area, and the ring shrinks over time. So there are readouts for slow, slowing progression, but it's, it but is slow. And one of the key questions is, do treatments which correct dysfunction prevent cell death? Now, we'll talk a little bit about the RP65 trials, which have been very successful, but they probably don't prevent, they improve function, which is great for readout of success, but they probably don't slow degeneration uh, of, in, in, in certain areas of the retina. And the second question is, do treatments which prevent cell death improve function? So there, it's, a, it's a complicated thing. Now, do we have any clues from clinical, um, uh, our clinical phenotyping that we can modify the effects of a primary mutation? In best disease, Everybody in the family carries the primary mutation, but some people have no phenotype apart from an abnormal EOG throughout life. They may get to 90 with normal vision. Other people might be blind in their 50s. So there's, there are obviously natural modifiers. Same with this gene, which uh, showed me about Acharya, which uh, uh, Tinal's uh, PhD supervisor and my long-standing collaborator. Um, this is a, a splicing factor gene present in every cell in the, in the body, in, has functions there causes a form of RP where generations are skipped. And in the original family, which I ascertained during my time in, in 83, 84 with Alan Bird, 30% um, of gene carriers do not show any phenotype at all throughout life. And you might think, well, the, the affected individuals will be mild, but they're not. They're severe and early onset. So in those families, there's a modifier, which if we could discover, we could use to treat RP. So there are naturally occurring models of ways in which to modify gene function. So, you know, here's a, a family with you've seen before, those of you who have been throughout the course, but this, this boy has best disease, it was the proband, the grandfather has best, but the father has 20-20 vision and absolutely nothing wrong with him apart from an abnormal EOG. Um, this aunt has minimal uh, disease. So in that family, and in many best families, there are natural modifiers that instead of having a primary mutation blinding you, you have normal, normal vision. So going back to, to what do we do at the moment, the conventional treatments, um, there are a few conditions where we understand the biochemistry, and this has an important message. If you understand the, the biology of a disorder, um, so if you find a gene, you, you spend a lot of time studying the biology of that gene, and if you understand it, there may be ways of treatment, and there are three conditions that you can modify the natural history with, with treatment. There's a long history of, of the Boston group pushing vitamin A supplementation, but I think virtually nobody uses that um, uh, because the, 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 it, there's a minimal effect in their clinical trials. We manage the complications like cystoid macular edema. And in these sort of cases, treatment may slow progression. So here's the case of gyrate atrophy, high levels of ornithine. There's a mutation in the OAT gene in the liver, and, and the ornithine levels are toxic to the retina. And what do we do with such children? We put them on a, a, a very uh, a restricted protein diet, and they hate it. They hate the diet. It's awful. And, um, and so we put this child on at 10, and this is a different patient at 34 years, um, and we can, over the years, document progression with visual fields, with ERGs, with um, 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 uh, other, other methods of imaging. Um, but how do we prove that we've done any good? Because we don't know anything about the natural history. We know a little bit about natural history. And so in, in, 
this is just to show you the problems with trying to slow, to monitor slow degeneration with novel therapies. So with novel therapies, the pathway has been, you know, in 1983, what we were doing was collecting families, working with the geneticists to try and ident to map the genes and to find the genetic variants that are pathological. And that was a very laborious process back then. But of course now with next generation sequencing, it's straightforward. We then um, do genotype, phenotype correlation. Um, when we found the genes, we, the, the biochemists looking at protein function, three scientists won the Nobel Prize 15 years ago or more for making, Nobel, for making mouse models, mouse knockouts, mouse knock-ins. So the mouse models and other naturally occurring animals have been very helpful in testing, understanding disease and testing therapies. The problem is the common um, animal model, the mouse, the rodents, have a rod-rich retina and, 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 and very few cones. So they're not a very good model. And in fact, the Foundation for Finding Blindness in the States are funding uh, a program at the moment to, to develop the squirrel, which is cone-rich as an animal model, and doing uh, the, finding out the squirrel genome and, and, and um, imaging um, squirrels, trying, trying to use other animal models. And of course, we've reached the stage now of human uh, treatment trials, which we'll be talking about later. And in terms of therapy and clinical trials, um, the severity of the disease determines which approach to use. So in early disease, um, we want to rescue photoreceptors. And the ones in blue have all been in clinical trial. Okay? As you get um, more severe, in severe uh, stage, you either have to use, when you've got very few uh, photoreceptors left, you either have to use tissue replacement or artificial vision. And um, this is the, um, um, the sort of, all these are um, a process, uh, 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 attempted therapies, which are uh, most of which are in clinical uh, trial. Um, and we'll be touching on some of those. Um, when is molecular diagnosis um, necessary? Well, for gene targeted therapy, you must know the mutation. When the therapy is targeted at a particular biochemical pathway, like in gyrate atrophy, you need to have a, a molecular diagnosis to be sure you've got the right disease. It's very important um, when you're choosing clinical uh, things to, um, uh, to, to know about natural history. And you know the best way to know about natural history is to look at genetic subtypes. And even for generic treatments, like stem cell therapy uh, or for artificial retina, some genetic forms, may, it may work better in some genetic forms than others. So I think all patients in clinical trials really should be genotyped. And here's an example where it's important. If I were to, to show this to the audience and say, right, I'm recruiting patients to a trial of ABCA4, right, uh, gene, the gene that causes Stargardt disease. Which of these patients would you include in the trial? Well, there's 612 vision with a lot of flex in an adult, a bit of atrophy here. Maybe you'd include that. Here's another one with a lot of atrophy and a little bit of foveal sparing and flex. And this child has no flex at all. Well, these two have ABCA4 bioallelic mutation. This is peripheral RDS. And it shows you the importance of having a genetic diagnosis. So um, gene-based therapies, um, in where you, the disease is caused by a lack of protein in recessive and X-linked disease, or in dominant disease, like aniridia, where the phenotype is caused by an absence of, it's caused by only having 50% of the level of protein, you, the, the approach is to place the gene back into the retina. Most dominant disease in, in retinal disease is a dominant negative or gain of function, where the, um, the mutant allele, the mutant protein, interferes with the function of the um, um, the, the normal copy. And so you could target silencing, destroying the mutant allele. It, it will leave you with just 50% of the protein. But for many diseases, that's enough. And many, many more 
Retinal disease now have both a dominant disease and a recessive disease. And the carriers of the recessive disease that have one mutant allele and one, one pathogenic allele and one normal are often normal. That, for example, in best disease, recessive best disease is more severe than dominant disease, more widespread. But the carriers, the parents of the recessive disease, are completely normal, which tells you that if you knock down in dominant disease the mutant allele, 50% is enough. So, um, uh, and there are rare forms of recessive disease, and we'll come on to that, where an intronic change, a regulatory change, introduces um, a, 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 a pathogenic va intronic variant, introduces um, a loss of gene function of an allele. And uh, one of, if one of the alleles is that, it's very easy to knock out the, much easier to knock out the intronic change and restore normal structure of the gene. And then you can use gene delivery for neuroprotective agents, and there's a trial under just started from the French group of using rod-derived cone viability factor, which is a factor which, as rods die, they lose that, and cones um, you know, may die because of the lack of this viability factor. Optogenetics is putting light-sensitive proteins into cells that normally wouldn't have light-sensitive, like ganglion cells or bipolar cells, and then finally, there's um, uh, oligo uh, oligonucleotides targeted at um, uh, mutant, uh, the RNA in, in, in disease. So the vet, you know, we, we, the gene delivery is either with, usually with vectors at the moment, AAV, different forms of AAV and lentivirus. Uh, the side of injection is mainly subretinal, unless you're targeting the inner retina, like ganglion cells, where intravitreal injection is a good approach. And this is just to, this is Jim um, Bainbridge and Robin Alice from their paper, 2003, early days, where they inject into, uh, this is a dog model, a normal dog, um, um, a AAV vector with green fluorescent protein, and then uh, six weeks post-injection, you've got lots of green fluorescent protein being uh, expressed in the retina, and this is the three years later. So you get persistent expression of, 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 of mutant uh, protein. And for those um, uh, VR surgeons in the, uh, the audience, um, this, um, it, um, this is the first patient treated in the RP65 trial by Jim Bainbridge, the vitro-retinal surgeon in London. And um, uh, this, this was a 20-year-old a, a man had they, they do a vitrectomy, and having having cleared the the, the vitreous, they then use a very fine needle to um, inject a bleb subretinally. And they start outside um, the fovea, um, and this was the first one that Jim did. And it's amazing, you know, and um, and then you use gas bubble to move that bleb into the position you you want it. And then um, um, at, at the end of the procedure, you do an air fluid exchange and you're left with um, uh, this sub, subfoveal bleb. And that fluid, on OC, you can track it on OCT, will be gone within you know, 10 days. So the, the first trial was of around the world was three groups did gene replacement therapy for RP65 deficiency. And the reason that was chosen um, is that it was a pigment epithelial gene that um, uh, was um, caused an, a childhood onset retinal dystrophy where there was useful vision in childhood, so in infancy. So you didn't have to worry about amblyopia in that sense or lack of visual experience. Bilelic mutations caused disease in man. There was a mouse knockout, two animals, and a dog um, naturally occurring dog model. Now, it's easier to transfect pigment epithelium than photoreceptors, so that was one reason for choosing it. Another reason was the fact that it wasn't exceptionally rare. And the third was that there was late cell death. So if, you know, what happens is this is an enzyme in, important in making all trans retinol back to 11 cis. So what you could imagine is the rods and cones are sitting there, um, and um, uh, they just lack a protein and if you could put that back there, um, then 
you should improve vision. You won't be working for slow degeneration. And um, what was interesting about these um, patients is they had no rod function at all, but they had cone, some cone function. And that led to the idea, and they explored this in mouse models, that cones have an alternative source of chromophore that's not derived from the retinal pigment epithelium. And that's not completely been sorted out, but it's, it, it is a fact. And the final reason for choosing this is the patients go blind. If you're using a novel therapy, you want to know um, they're going to go blind. So the, um, just to show you um, a, a one patient, this was a, a five-year-old that was in the original trial, 636 vision in each eye. Now look that, they've got then 5 print by holding print closer. They're not going to be amblyopic. They have a completely normal fundus initially, and, and pigment is very late. Pigment in, in the retina means cell death. And... Um, and it, she has some residual uh, cone function. Now, this was the original trial that, that was driven by Robin Ali um, and, and, and Jim Bainbridge, who was the, the VR surgeon. Um, and um, it, it, um, it shows that gene therapy was safe using the AAV vector. And it would, in the original trial from London, it improved rod function a thousandfold. But there were, in the London trial, there was very minimal improvement in vision, no change in the ERG. And there were two other uh, trials, one out of Florida, but this, um, the group out of um, the Philadelphia Children's Hospital, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, with Al McGuire um, and Jean Bennett, um, they showed better cone improvement, but they used a, a slightly different promoter. They used a, a ubiquitous promoter. But anyway, all through three groups published and showed safety, improved retinal function, particularly of, of rods, but there was no improvement in the ERG. And that probably repaired the animals because you're giving the treatment later in humans. Um, the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia then went on to do injections in the second eye and showed it was safe. You got inflammation, but it was covered by systemic steroids, which damped it down. And then they did the uh, definitive trial. Now, how do you get patients to go in a trial when the animal model works so well. Well, they came out with a very nice design that they promised the controls they could cross over to treatment after a year. And so recruitment wasn't a problem. It's two to one subjects to controls, short interval between both eyes, and a subretinal injection again. And this, the primary endpoint was how you performed in a maze, how much light you had to have to go through the maze. So at low, can you get through a maze at low light levels, which mainly uh, measured... Uh, rod function, and a secondary outcome was global sensitivity and visual acuity. And the, the final things were published in Lancet in, in, in 2017. This was, you know, 30 years after this thing was, it, 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 you know, it's a very slow process from the preclinical stage all the way through, but of course, after the first trial, that will be accelerated. And the most amazing thing from, from, to me, because of my experience with Robin Arley's vector, was the um, average improvement of 8.1 letters, and a fifth of the patients had 15-letter improvement, which is fantastic. And they improved um, macular sensitivity, improved Goldman fields, but the fovea sensitivity didn't change at all. Something about the fovea, which means... Um, and, and this was a, a, a landmark uh, occasion. The Lux Turner gene therapy, which the, the therapy that came out of the, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, got FDA approval. And um, it's now being used around the world. So if you look back, um, the, the, the first you know, gene therapy applications for humans were back here in the end of you know, mid-80s. And, um, uh, and it took, um, it took um, sort of nearly 30 years to get from... And, and before then, they were doing preclinical work. It was a very long lead-in time. But of course, that has, uh, uh, that has changed. And um, there are now more than 30 trials of, of different forms of gene-targeted um, gene therapy. And these are the um, gene re current gene replacement therapies for single gene disorders. And um, I've, the two highlighted in blue are the only ones really, it's, it's really, um, it's, it's really um, disappointing that um, have shown um, a really um, a, a, a good effect. And this one I'm going to talk a little bit about because it's a little bit um, complicated. All of these other trials uh, have been disappointing, which is a shame. 
So we come on to, to um, gene replacement therapy for the, um, uh, for the optic nerve. Labus hereditary optic neuropathy, as you know, is associated with three primary mutations um, in complex one of the respiratory chain. And um, uh, uh, it mainly affects young males, but it's, it's very variable. Usually optic neuropathy in one eye followed by another. And some cases, not usually the commonest mutation, which is the ND4, can show spontaneous recovery, which, of course, complicates trials. So the, the gene therapy trial is using um, um, an AAV vector containing the ND... This is for the commonest form of labus hereditary optic neuropathy, containing the ND, uh, ND4 cDNA. But you've got to get that into mitochondria. You can't stick mitochondria... DNA, you, know, you can't stick it in mitochondria. So what they did is... They, in the gene therapy construct, they put two mitochondrial targeting sequences on either side of the cDNA. And so the, the, you inject into the vitreous, it gets into the ganglion cells, goes to the nucleus, you transcribe the protein, and that is because of those targeting sequences, it goes into the mitochondria. So it's rather a bit more complicated than in, 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 in the monogenic disorders we talked about. And the recruits had ND4-related disease with no recovery. And the worst seeing eye was treated, and the other eye acted as a control. Now, the early trials done in Miami and in Paris, the two groups, showed good safety profile and some visual improvement, but they were small numbers. And then they reported the Paris group, um, and, and my colleague uh, Patrick Yohan now working in Cambridge, was um, the clinical lead. Josie Sahel is the... the the, the chief in, in, in Paris, um, the chairman. The, the real difficulty with this is they got amazing uh, improvement. Um, you, the mean improvement of, of, of 13 EDTRS letters. Um, um, and some of the subjects got even more improvement. That, that is a huge improvement. But the problem was the control eye uh, improved almost as much. And... Um, so what's, you know, what, what, what is going on? So what they then did is they took a primate, put the vector in one eye, and they tracked the other. They looked to the other eye to see if the vector got to the other eye, which it did through the chiasm. Now, the difficulty is you, might, you can detect the vector in the other eye, but really, would it get to there as a level enough to cause this improvement? Now, um, a lot of people would say, well, does it matter? If you get treat, you know, the effect in the other eye, it's even better. Um, but I think they, they, they're going to run into problems with the regulators until they try and do further experiments to work this out. So it really illustrates the LHON trial of how complex these clinical trials are in, in, in man. So the, the sort of, from the patient's perspective, what they want to know is when is it going to come in the clinic? So what is needed for success in bringing a, a new product to market? Well, the first thing is to choose the right disease, and we have not been very good at that. The early gene therapy, the, the first gene therapy trial for RP65, there was a big conference in Paris about 25 years ago when everybody interested in the field met. There was a two-day discussion with lots of brief talks about which genes might be appropriate, and a consensus sort of statement was, was drawn up. And there was a 100% consensus that RP65 was the first way to go. That was a good way to do it. What happened with the next trials is someone had their favorite mouse model, like the myosin 7A trial, um, and they thought it would be good for humans. Myosin 7A causes Usher syndrome type 1. All the patients before cochlear implants are totally deaf, completely deaf with tunnel vision, how are you going to follow them up in a clinical trial? How are you going to do it? Why would you choose that? Any, if they talked to any clinician that was interested in the field, they would have said, leave it. Some of the other trials that were done, um, they were done in children that had um, no vision from birth, actually no vision. People looked at the OCT of those children and said, oh, they've got photoreceptors there, but they've got perception of light vision. We can make things better. Why would you choose that? Um, so we haven't been very good at um, choosing the right thing. And even when we have been good, like achromatopsia trials, 
that's a very good target if you think it all through. It hasn't worked very well. So there's, there's quite a long way to go. So the first thing is to um, uh, choose a disease, the right disease, one that you know about the natural history potential to improve function, because drug companies don't like looking for slow degeneration. Gene that's small enough to be packaged, and ideally a good animal model, a large animal model. And one of the good things about the early gene therapy trials is they've shown that, that the viral vectors used were safe. So now, if you, um, if you come up with, uh, like the choroideremia trial, the preclinical studies did not include any animal model. All that they in included was cell-based systems showing that you can change the biochemistry. And one of the great advances in iPS cell technology, making um, photoreceptors from, from stem cells, is you can use those iPS cells to look at the effect of, of, of treatment. Um, you've got to show biological, you know, you want to, um, to see a biological effect in man with good safety profile in the early stages. And then you, 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 the big companies will do a, um, a, um, a um, uh, they will do a study um, with outcome measures and hope they meet the outcome measures. And, and again, one of the problems with the outcome measures, they want to look at improved function. Um, so the, if I talk about the current situation with RP65 deficiency, those big long list of trials all worked in the first few patients and then they published a very um, a, a great um, they published a great um, uh, paper saying it, this, this works. But when they come to the phase three trial, they, they haven't worked. They haven't all published, but they've been, on the whole, disappointing. We can see from abstracts at Arvo and the publishers that have been done. Sanofi have discontinued their myosin 7A and ABCA4 trials um, that, that I chaired the DSMB, which uh, are using lentivirus. Biogen bought um, the Nightstar company that Rob McLaren started with the choroideremia trial and RPGR trial. They've folded that. AGTC have folded the retinoscycin trial because that didn't meet its outcome measures. So it's not great news. Um, there are other um, approaches. We won't have time to talk about them all. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, um, uh, antisense oligonucleotides. Um, these are nucleotides that interfere with, with um, RNA and, and knock down the, the mutant RNA. And um, where it's been used... Um, that's strange. It's come up um, up there. On the, on the computer, it's normal. Yeah, it just changed. I think you can just... Uh, yeah. Um, but anyway, so the, there is a common mutation in, or common variant in this gene, pathogenic variant, where the, there's an intronic change which affects splicing. So you put, have an extra exon put into the structure, and that exon, extra exon, leads to a stop. So you've got one of the alleles, or sometimes you're, you're biallelic. Um, Give me a second. Yeah, no, sure. Um, 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 one of the alleles, the pathogenesis is an intronic change. And so what you can do is target that intronic change either with CRISPR or with antisense oligonucleotides. Um, and um, uh, a company, ProQR, has... Um, no, sorry. Yeah, I don't know why it's done that, but never mind. We can, we can just leave it yeah, like that. Swap the oh, at the top. Does it swap the yeah, well, I it's not showing on here. That's the problem at the top. If you go down to the escape, you might see it. No, uh, wait, I'll just do mirror. Oh, yeah. No. I've got to mirror it. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's very strange that's done that, but that, 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 that these computers have their own. Um, so, Pokuar have done a trial of, um, uh, of oligonucleotide um, injections into the vitreous in, in, this, in this condition. Um, Ah, thank you very much. Um, and um, uh, the reason it was chosen was, and it's quite a severe disease, is that there's sparing of the fovea on OCT. Um, and um, this is a patient with this disorder. This, the real problem is many of the patients have very poor vision. Some milder mutations do have some useful vision. But you, you often get, this is a child um, of a few months old, 
uh, white flecks throughout the retina, but you can see the, the fovea looks pretty good. And when you do an OCT, the fovea looks, looks good. And one of her variants was this um, intronic uh, frame shift mutation. And you know, this, when this paper was published, I thought, oh, we have a second um, success. They, you gave intravitreal in injections, and it was, it was published in, in 2022, I think. Was it, uh, um, um, they, they showed significant improvement uh, in patients. There was an off-target effect in that most of the patients got cataract, but cataract is, is, is treatable. And um, um, uh, this sort of summarizes that. But there was a significant improvement in, in, view it, in visual acuity um, in 50% um, uh, of, 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 of the patients had three lines of improvement. Well, that's massive for um, a retinal a dystrophy that causes poor vision. But um, recently, ProQR, in fact, a few months after this paper, put out a press release um, saying that they were not pursuing licensing because the phase three trial, which they haven't reported yet, but they're analyzing still, didn't meet its outcome measures. So probably the patients in the early trial were the ones chosen that, that were milder. And when you took the overall thing, um, you won't uh, meet the, the, the market. So there are other approaches, including optogenetics, putting in into the bipolar cells and into the ganglion cells light-sensitive chemicals. But these give very crude vision. You have to wear you know, special spectacles. Um, and um, this field is improving, but it really is like the artificial retina. It's, it's, it's going to give you back um, crude vision for people that are, that are blind. Um, cell transplantation... Um, there's a load of stem cell trials registered on, on clinicaltrials.gov. They're either um, mature cells grown up and put on a little patch and put under the re peripheral retina. Um, they've been done, for example, in Stargardt disease at a very early stage. But in general with stem cells, you either use stem cells to deliver a transient effect where you upregulate growth factors from the stem cells that help the retina or what you really need is to um, be able to transplant them into the subretinal space where they will hook up to bipolar cells and, and in, in the best case scenario and give you vision. And the real problem there is how do you overcome the problems of, of correcting neural integration? That's not a problem with RPE transplantation because RPE cells don't have that problem. So it's going to happen first with, with RPE cells in... in um, in, in RPE disease, but of course, by the time you're putting it in, you've lost photoreceptors, you really need both things. So I'm just gonna, um, this was a Rob McLaren, a Robin Arley paper that caused uh, a, a, such a, 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 a degree of optimism again. They took early born rods from mice and they put it into a mouse with an inherited photoreceptor dystrophy. And they showed that the vision improved um, using the sort of test you do for mice. And they put it in very early in the retinal dystrophy, so there wasn't a lot of cell death. And this is the, the paper where, that showed the photoreceptors they put in were tagged with green fluorescent protein. So you can see those cells in the retina. And they showed that it hooked up to, to bipolar cells. And so that was a big breakthrough. Um, but then uh, Rob McLaren in Oxford, and then followed by Ro Robin Arnie and, and another group in Europe, showed that the reason that they were hooked up to bipolar cells was that the green fluorescent protein was transferred into the neighboring host photoreceptors. And people have worked further on this now and showed there are a, a nano nanotubules connecting photoreceptors and stuff goes across. Um, and why did the vision improve in those mouse, mice? Well, possibly because stuff went across um, from the transplanted normal mice into the cytoplasm of the host cells. So there's a lot of work going on at the moment to, it's a whole new area of looking at intercellular transfer in the retina. And could you use that for treatment? Well, it's a possibility. But it does show that stem cell transplantation is, is it's not straightforward. The, like everything else in biology, it's very complicated. So uh, there are a lot, you know, this is just to touch upon the, the the, the field and tell you what um, uh, uh, um, what uh, where we are 
and, and, and going, you know, things hopefully improve going forward. So just to summarize, many interventions work in the animal models. We have to answer the question, which um, do we prioritize, which of the 200 genes or the 200 disorders do we prioritize for tumor trials? Can we make animal models better? We can. We can make the animal model people treat at a stage that's appropriate for human disease, later in the disease, maybe. And we should ask the animal model people to, like humans, do randomized controlled trials, not choose the six best, best mice for publication. And um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit unkind to the animal model people, but they, if you read the papers, they're not really often clear about, uh, about that. And um, the challenges that remain of choosing the correct disease are identifying the time point when um, disease is likely to be amenable to therapy, so we need not more natural history studies, get better at detecting a treatment effect, and get better at defining outcome measures that make a difference. And you have to show for the regulators and for the um, for funding bodies that, that it improves the quality of life of, of patients. So, you know, when I, when I was a medical student in Oxford a long time ago, I went to, well, 1973, four, in Oxford, they, it was depressing being on the children's ward, paediatric wards, because all the children with cancer died, all the children with leukemia died, and the paediatricians used to give talks and talk about all the research they were doing to try and find treatments, and, you know, this idea that there'll be a magic bullet for cancer came up, but there was never a magic bullet. There were lots of silver bullets which, when combined, treated the child, and most children with cancer survive now, and the research now is to reduce morbidity from the treatments, not to save their lives. Um, and that's to what, what will happen in RP. There'll be gene-targeted therapies, probably supported by neuroprotective factors, maybe with stem cells as well. So combination therapy, I think in the future, if I was to predict the future, that will become the norm. But I think the final point is, we come back to the patient. Patients, you know, I can say to them, 30 years, absolutely massive improvements, um, but, um, uh, uh, and, and you just gotta be patient. And, and the patient will come back and say, you told me that 20 years ago, when I, you know, when I was 30, I'm 50 now, I can't wait 30 years again. You know, they, they say we're a long way from meeting the expectations of our patients, but you know, there is progress. And for the younger people in the audience, you know, inherited eye disease is where you should be targeting your careers. There's gonna be fantastic improvements um, uh, in, in the future uh, with all the advances. Thank you very much. Prof Moore for that interesting lecture. I think it's given us a lot to think about. Maybe he has introduced more questions than answers. Yeah. Um, is there, are there any questions from anyone in the audience? No? Okay. Tony, thank you uh, for a great lecture. Um, so, um, just on your, on your, on your, just to pick your brain, basically, on your yeah. thoughts. I mean, you've seen a lot of change. You've seen a lot of development in the field, as you basically mentioned. Um, if you, I mean, you said like 30 years down the line, if we make it a little bit closer, out of all the technologies that you basically yeah. showed, do you think that what is what is the most closest thing that would for, a, for from approval status? Um, from, a, from a regulatory standpoint, because once you do, do all these trials, the reason one of the issues is, is that obviously then getting past all the regulatory authorities can be a massive hurdle. And I mean, one of, the, one of the advantages of all the vector therapies is that they've sort of broken through the sort of glass roof, so to speak, so that, that then allows other things that may be faster. And we may see a rapid pace of development in the next 10 years because of that. So where's, what's, the, what's the thing that you think now will be next to the next to the RP65? Yeah, that's, that's going to be um, difficult. I, I, I think there are two areas. For people with really severe disease, I think optogenetics and, um, um, and retinal uh, implants. I know the, the companies, have, you know, the retinal implant companies have, have, have tended to fold, but people are still working in that area. I mean, um, technology 
always advances much faster than biology. So I think that um, I think retinal implant for severe disease. I think retinal implants still have have possibilities. I've met patients in, that had the that were in the original retinal implant uh, trial, and 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 it and it really. It, it, it was very crude, but it did, imp it did improve their vision. I think optogenetics, because it's, it's, you don't have to slow cell death or anything. You just um, have to put a protein in somewhere that, that was already there. And when, you can optimize that more easily. So I think at the severe end of the spectrum, that's going to happen faster than stem cells. Um, I, th I still think that um, it's likely that um, uh, the antisense, the oligonucleotide story won't be finished uh, because... One of the things about next generation sequencing of, of missing alleles in recessive disease, for example, they're picking up a lot of these intronic variants, or relatively, you know, a number of these intronic variants in relatively common disease, rare diseases that introduce cryptic exons and, 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 and screw up the sequence. And those are targetable. And those are very targetable by CRISPR, so with gene editing. Um, and in dominant disease, I think gene editing, um, knocking out one allele, um, they'll, it holds out a lot of promise. The trouble is, again, with that, there'll be um, disappointments down the line because there'll be off-target effects or some other thing. But, yeah, I, I, I think it's likely that the next thing will be some... at uh, uh, the severe end of the spectrum, um, advanced in those two areas. And for the gene-targeted therapies, I think there will be another success with gene replacement. Um, hopefully labor hereditary optic neuropathy. They've got a little way to go to work out um, what's happening there, but the, the results were pretty stunning uh, from the trial. And then the, the slower process will probably be um, uh, anti antisense oligonucleotides followed by um, gene editing. The trouble with the gene editing story, at the moment all you can do is knock down alleles in in the retina because it, you can't do base editing in, well, you can do it, but it doesn't work very efficiently in non-dividing cells. So, um, you know, it, it, that's going to work really well for immune things where you take these cells out of the patient, you edit them and put them back in again. Yeah. But, you know, I'm, I'm probably completely wrong. <laughs> but there's also work with like small molecules in EVs as well, right? So yeah. people are looking at, at that and that seems to be from a regulatory standpoint, a little bit easier to get approvals from um, yeah. because you can almost manufacture the EVs at a almost like a drug at, yeah. with quality control. And then if you can then, and then the delivery is relatively straightforward yeah. as well. And you, I mean, sort of follows on from like from what you showed from Andy and Rob's paper yeah. um, in, in that way. But that seems to be an interesting area. Yeah, it is. The other area that, that is, is going to be very interesting is this inter, intercellular transfer in um, in photoreceptors, and I presume I wouldn't be surprised if it happens in gang. Does it happen in ganglion cells? Uh, Tin or not? maybe maybe intercellular. Uh, have they shown these channels between uh, ganglion cells? Is there much exchange of um, cellular material? I mean, I, they probably. I don't think it's been done in. In um, it would be interesting to to see, but um, yeah. Good. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, thank you.